you ever have one of those gifts? You know, a gift inside of a gift that's inside of a gift. You, you open up that first gift and you discover what's inside of it is another wrapped present, another gift, much like a, a, um, a Russian nesting doll. You've got the large one inside the large ones, the smaller one inside that small one. It keeps getting smaller and smaller and finally you get down to that one gift that's actually the gift itself inside. Well, in our study of Revelation, it's something similar to that. However, the gifts are surprises, are things that we really enjoy. But that gift is something that someone is giving to us. When we come to the book of Revelation, there we see these things unveiling. We open up one and things keep coming. When you open up another, they're not gifts. Actually, they're something quite different. And in our study of the book of Revelation, we're Revelation chapter 6. We're going to be looking at the four horsemen this morning. And as we take our time to look at them, I want you to see that this is God's judgment that He is pouring out upon the world around us. Now, He is giving John an insight, letting John see what is to come. And as John is trying to understand and trying to write these things down, he is explaining what he sees as it's being revealed. Though when we look at it and read it, we're quite, not quite sure. But I'm hoping as we take a few minutes today and look into Revelation chapter 6, if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to join, it, join me. And I'm going to be working through the, uh, verse 1 through verse 8. So with your Bibles in hand, please join me. I'm going to start with verse 1. We'll read a little bit, stop, talk about it, and keep going until we get down to the verse 8. So if you have your Bibles, please join me in Revelation chapter 6. Now John writes, Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see! And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering to conquer. Well, let's pause right there for this little moment. John is describing for us, we've seen in chapters 4 and 5, where he has gone into heaven. He heard a loud voice saying, come up here. John leaves the world and goes into heaven. He's entered into the throne room of heaven, and in heaven, before God, he sees all that is going on. He sees the majesty of God. He sees all the wonders of who God is around his throne. He sees these things and begins to describe it. Chapter 6 leads to the, uh, chapter 5 leads us into seeing who is going to take the scroll that's in the hand of God on the throne. John looks around. There's no one worthy. No one in earth is worthy. And as he begins to weep, he's told, Look, there is one. See him over there at the throne. And John begins to describe Jesus. He is the lamb that was slain, but yet stands alive. He was the lion of Judah. He was the one that was worthy. And as he went and he picked up the scroll from God the Father on the, hand, on the throne, and got the Son, Jesus, holding the scroll, and that's where John leaves us at the end of chapter 5. Now when we get into chapter 6, as I was just reading, Jesus takes that scroll and he begins to open it. He breaks one of those seals and opens it. And John says, the lamb, referring to Jesus, opened one of the seals. This is one of the seven seals on the scroll. And each seal that's broke reveals something new as far as judgments upon this world. And as John reveals, uh, uh, writes down what he sees, we get some insight. So, so as we're reading, the seal is broke, the lamb is opening up the scroll. Maybe it's something similar to this. As John, it describes the lamb that's there, it describes the lion, and seeing Jesus opening up the scroll, it could be that was what he was looking and what he's seeing. Just to give us a part to think about in our imagination, Jesus opening up the scroll. And as that scroll is broken, an angel's voice comes out and says, Come and see! Well, 
I think the translation here is a little, little awkward. Because John's already there. He doesn't need to come to see. He is describing, he says at the beginning of the verse, and I saw. So he sees what's going on. I think this term in the Greek is better understood to either say just come, as in come forth, or to go. It's probably a better one here to understand because it does that word does have the meaning to go. So I think as the scroll is being broke, the seal's being broken, the scroll is open up, the one of the living creatures speaks up and says, Go forth. Get on, go out of here. Referring to someone in verse 2. So in verse 2 we see, and behold, I looked and I saw a white horse. So I think the angel, the cherubim, one of the four living creatures, as he speaks these words, and he says, come, come, or go, depending on the, the Greek word, come either way, go, he's referring to the person who's riding that white horse. Now that person is described like this, and he who sat on it had a bow, and he had a crown, which was given to him, and he went out conquering to conquer. A couple of interesting things I want to draw your attention to. First, you notice that he has the bow, but no arrows. So he has the bow, he has a means of, of um, threatening people, of conquering with the, with the bow, but no arrows. But we also see that he was given a crown. Now notice the term here says crown. This isn't, isn't the royal crown that we often refer to, the diadem that is given to God. This is the Stephopinus, which is the victor's crown. In a reference to the Olympic Games that when the athlete in the Olympics Games won, he received a crown of greenery. It was a crown of victory. And it lasted for a short period of time because the greenery eventually, no, it dies. But this is that same term here. This isn't a crown of, of royalty, the diadem that Christ will receive, that Jesus receives. But this is the victor's crown. So this first rider, seals broke. He is on the white horse. He goes out and his purpose is to conquer and conquering. I see as we're looking at this, this is the individual who is going to be the first world uh, ruler. Coming sometime in our future, we don't know exactly when, but the a world ruler. Some have identified him as possibly Christ, referring to Revelation 19.11. Jesus comes riding upon a white horse. But this one's a little different. Because in Revelation 19.11, it identifies who that person is. He's the King of Kings and is the Lord of Lords. And written on his side is his name. Here, John just says, he went out conquering to conquer. He had a crown. I believe this is a reference to what Daniel talks about. Let me share, share some verses from you from Daniel. Daniel talks about a one world ruler, conqueror, and he says this in Daniel chapter 9, verses 26. And after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not from himself, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the cities and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with flood, and the end of the war, desolations are determined. Here he is. He says that there is this prince that is to come. Now I think this is what John is seeing in Revelation. The prince that is to come. He's riding on that white horse. He's coming conquering to conquer. It means that he is going to take over the entire world, either by force or by, by manipulation. One of the two, but he is going to set himself up as going to be the Messiah. There's going to be an issue going on, and he is going to be the one who's going to come in, and he is going to say, I can provide guidance and peace, and I can provide the structure we need in order to control everything if you surrender your sovereignty to me and let me rule. Everything will be great. This is his plan. And he comes in with the ability, and he's been given the right, according to what we read from John in Revelation chapter 6, he has gone out to conquer, to conquer. Now, Jesus says this in Matthew about the same time, about the same type of person. He says, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, 
but they will be deceived. That's Matthew 24, 5. In 1 John, he writes about this. He says, little children, in that last hour, as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. So he says that there is coming a time when the Antichrist will be here, but there's many others that are, that are stepping up, that are around us now, that are against Christ now. But there's one Antichrist that is. So in John, Revelation chapter 6, I think this is that person that John is referring to on the white horse. The Antichrist, that one world re, uh, leader. So as John is delivering and giving us this insight, he talks about this first leader that is coming. But then he also goes on and Christ continues to break the next seal. First seal is broke, the white horse comes out with the rider who is going to conquering to conquer. Second seal is broke, and now we're in Revelation chapter 6, verse 3. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come! And another horse, fiery red, red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, that the people who should kill one another, and there was given him a great sword. So the white horse, the first one that came, he was going out conquering to conquer, declaring that there is going to be peace. It's the Antichrist, the one rule re uh, leader. He is going to declare there's going to be peace and make peace with the entire world, peace with the Middle East, peace, peace everywhere. But shortly after that, the second seal is broken, and then there's another horse, a fiery red horse. And one who's upon that, he is gone, and his permission and his task is to remove peace from the earth. The first one, the Antichrist, is setting up the process of declaring and taking control and making peace. Shortly after he has ruled, there's an influence that is coming, and it was going to eradicate peace upon the earth. He's given a great sword as a sword of a warrior, sword, a sword of war. He is coming to declare war. Not necessarily referring to an individual, but more so the influence of the Antichrist. Because part of his task is to declare peace, to get rulership, and then he's going to break that peace and declare war. I find it interesting what happens as this war takes place. Look with me if you were back in your Bibles, verse 4. And the horse, and another horse, a fiery red horse, went out, and he was granted to the one who rode on it, who sat on it, to take peace from the earth, and the people should kill one another. That we, at that moment, the humans that are here, are going to turn upon one another and we're going to kill each other. The first horse, the rider on it, was to conquering, to conquer, to declare peace. Shortly after all the peace has been declared and all the peace has been gained, he flips the switch and becomes the warrior to bring about war and desolation upon the world to the point where individuals are seeking and killing themselves, killing each other. Zacharias says this, in Zechariah 14, 13, referring to the same time period, we find this, And it shall come to pass in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among everyone Will seize, and everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 6 and 7 about this same time period. So in the future. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famine, pestilence, earthquakes, in various places, all these are the beginnings of sorrow. So Jesus says in verse 24, chapter 24, in Matthew chapter 24, 
that there's going to be rumors, even before this Antichrist comes, there's going to be rumors of wars in this area and wars in this area. In another part of the world, we're going to have wars, and there's going to be pestilence that are coming. There's going to be famines that are coming. But this is just the beginnings, not even the start, not even the real thing, just a little hint of what is to come. Well before the Antichrist comes, and we kind of see some of that going on with us now. Jesus says those are just the beginnings, just a taste of what is to come. But when we get into Revelation chapter 6, and we see that this red horse rider comes out, he is going to be declaring war, and there's going to be a world war like we've never seen a world war before. This is the declaration that John is seeing. The first one was to come out, he was the world conqueror, believing to be the Antichrist, the, 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 the guy that's declaring peace and, and has peace and gained peace as he gains control. And then he declares war. He's going to start wars. People are going to be fighting against each other. And as this is taking place, the third seal, we see Christ breaking the seal. So we're back in Revelation chapter 6, verse 5. And John writes, and when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come! So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he went out, and, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And who and do not harm the oil, and the wine. Interesting here. What this horse is doing, what this rider is given to do, he is given out in order to measure out the cost of things that are going on, the scale in his hand. Because he says it's going to have to measure the wheat and the barley, and it's going to be bought at an extraordinary high price. This is a denarius. That is a, a day's worth of money for a small portion of wheat, and maybe just a little bit larger portion of barley. But barley was considered a poor man's grain. So we have the wheat and the barley being sold for a whole day's worth of wages. And pause and think for a minute. Think about what you make a day. Would you be willing to pay that for a loaf of bread? What you make a day for a loaf of bread. That's pretty much what the measurement of wheat and barley was. You used that to make a loaf of bread and that was what you were able to eat for, for the day. Imagine having to do that every day, every day of the week. This is that third rider. He's coming out and the cost of things are going to skyrocket because of war that's going on. The, call, the food supplies are going to be cut off. Uh, the, the food is not going to be available for anyone to get. And what is available, only the wealthy are going to be able to afford it. The poor man, the middle man, they're all going to miss out on it because they could not and they cannot, they will not be able to afford to pay the prices for the food that's going to be available. As small as it is, as scarce as it is going to be. So his first rider, he's going to declare peace. Second rider, he's come out, and he is the one who, through his influence, changes that peace, and it takes it away, and war is going to happen. As war happens, food supplies get cut off. The supply is no longer there. The growth of things are not going to be there. And then, the, as a result, the cost of things increase. All this is in the future. All these things are going to come take place in the future. Jesus says in Matthew 24, verses 6 and 7. Oh, we read that one. Ezekiel says this one. Ezekiel, verse 4, 16 and 17. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, surely I will cut off the supply of bread in Jerusalem. Thou shalt eat bread by weight and with anxiety, and shall drink water by measure and with dread that they may lack bread and water and be dismayed with one another and waste away because of their iniquities. All this is the result. This is the things that the prophets have foretold. These are the destructions, the, the punishments of God, the judgments of God upon a sinful world that is coming. 
The first man's coming to declare peace, and he's going to gain rulership over the entire world through his declaration of peace. But shortly after he gets control of everything, war is going to break out. He's going to declare war upon everybody, upon others who don't follow and listen after him. And as the wars increase, the food supply is going to drop. And as that happens, the fourth seal is broke. Back in Revelation chapter 6. Got your Bibles? Here we go. Verse 5. No, we read verse 5. Verse 7 is where we are. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on the horse, on the horse was Death. And Hades followed him. And power was given to them over the fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, and with, by the beasts of the earth. So the fourth rider upon a pale horse, his name is Death. Falling behind him is Hades. Whether he's on a horse or riding the same horse or he is just coming out some way walking, I don't know, who knows. But Death and Hades come forth. The angel, the fourth living creature, says, Come! So death and Hades, upon the breaking of the fourth seal and the, de and the declaration by the fourth living creature, they come out upon the world. And they have been given the right, given the authority, to kill one-fourth of all of humanity that's living on the earth at the time. Back into Scripture, this, this is what it says. So look looked, and behold, a pale horse... And the name on him who wrote it was death. And Hades followed him, and the power was given to them over one-fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beast of the earth. So the first living, the first horse rider, the Antichrist, he comes out declaring peace, declares uh, peace upon all the world, and takes over the authority of the world. He's ruling the everything. Shortly after he's doing this and he's got his rule and he got his things set, the, um, he declares war. War happens. War is going to be spreading over all the world. Who knows how many are dying as a result of this war? But as all of this war is taking place, famine begins to come in. Pestilence begins to rise up. Food supplies are cut short. Prices go skyrocketing for just a little bit to buy, but a little bit to eat. And as these things are happening, death and Hades are coming along. And as a result of the war, a result of pestilence, a result of, of the famine, the results of beasts rising up and killing other humans, one-fourth of humanity dies as a result of all of this. It doesn't take long for us to see how pestilence is going to kick in. Even right now, here in, here in April of 2020, We've been impacted by a pestilence that has come about as a result of animals in contact with humans and passing on a virus that has spread the world, how quickly it has spread. This is just a taste. We see it happening now. We see how it is impacting our lives, how this virus from China, this Wuhan pneumonia, as it's been called, as it has impacted us and infected us so quickly and has shut down our world so fast, that is just a taste, a small taste of what it is to come into the future, of what this pestilence that John is writing about is going to happen. Death comes to one-fourth of the world. Right here at the beginning, not too long after the first seal has been broke, Second seal comes, third seal, and the fourth seal is the death of one-fourth of, of, of humanity. All this is taking place so quickly. It's hard for us to uh, vision everything into the future, but we get a little taste of what that is now. Which leads me to this question. As we think about all that's coming forth, as the death is taking place by sword, by beast, by hunger, by famine, by pestilence, as all of this is taking place, 
John is writing and describing quickly what it is. I see this guy, he rides a horse, he goes out, and this happens upon the world. This is God's judgments. These are the first four of the judgments that God is pouring about upon the unbelieving world. So the question that comes to me is this. Where will you be at this time? Now, if you're a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, the rapture has happened. That's the beginning of chapter 4 in Revelation. Revelation chapter 4, the rapture has happened. We've gone into heaven. We're in heaven, so we're not going to be facing this. But if you haven't believed and given your heart to Christ, you could be on this world when all of this is taking place. You could be here experiencing this war, this famine, the exorbitant cost of food. could be part of all of this and receive God's judgment upon you. So my, I beg of you and I ask of you, Give your life to Christ, not in fear of the judgments to come, but because of what He's done for you. He died on the cross for you to take the sin out of your life, to give you a new heart and a new life. To have a relationship with Him means that you're going to have an entrance into heaven. And without that relationship, then there is no going to heaven. No matter what we do, no matter how many good things we do, no matter how many times we give to the church, no matter how many prayers we pray, no matter how great we treat others, we can treat others better than we treat ourselves. None of those works are going to guarantee you a relationship with Jesus Christ and thus a entrance into heaven. Only giving your life to Christ. Asking His forgiveness for the sins that are there the sins that we've committed. And when we receive His forgiveness, we're given a new heart, a new spirit, we're given a new life. We become new creations in Christ, according to Paul. We have a relationship with the God of the universe. So I ask of you, will you give your heart to Christ now? Is that something that you're willing to do? What's keeping you from giving your life to Christ? Is that person? Is that thing? Is that job? Is it really that important that it will keep you from going to heaven? I think not. And I think that you know that too. And I believe that as you are listening even now, you feel the tug of God on your heart to give your heart to Christ. Will you do so? It's very easy. There are no magical words, no religious uh, formula that must take place. It's just a cry of a sinner's heart to the living God who listens and he's been saying and he's been tugging and he has been drawing and says, Yes, child, come home, come to me. Let me forgive you. Will you do that now? Even now as I pray. Pray along with me where you are. With your heads bowed, let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you so much, Lord, that you can save individuals. Maybe someone's listening who needs you now. And I pray, Father, that your hand will reach out and touch them and let them know that right now they are the ones who need you. Here's how you can pray. Father, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Wash me clean. Make me one of your children. And I will follow you with all that I have in my life. If you have saved that prayer, I would love to know. You can let us know on the Facebook page. You see it showing up on your screen. And as you share it there, I'll be sure to get back with you and contact you and let you know what to do next. Because we would love to be able to celebrate with you what you have done in giving your heart to Christ. It's my prayer, even now, that you'll have the boldness to do so. I'm going to close this all in a prayer. Join me. Precious dear Father, we thank you so much for our day. Thank you for the chance to study the book of Revelation. And as we do, Lord, we pray that you will be honored. 
As we point people to your word, may your spirit speak to their hearts and draw them to your throne room. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. I love to see you in church when we're able to get together again. Hope things are going well. And